God, you continue to take care of your children. We are your flock. And as you have gathered us out of many different, difficult and different situations, preparing us for the final events of Earth's history, may each of us fully understand and appreciate the great privilege of being in this movement. Along with that privilege comes great responsibility. During this camp meeting, may each of us examine our hearts. To see whether or not we are in the faith. Whether or not we are worthy to be given the title of priest. In Jesus' name, Amen. This is our third presentation. We've spoken about the 14th Amendment and I know that most of you realise that the 14th Amendment, Amendment is midway There are 27 amendments and the 14th is midway And we spoke about the post-Civil War amendments specifically 13, 14 and 15 and if you've watched Elder Tessie's presentations it will not have escaped your attention that her focus is on the years 2013, 14 and 15. So, you've heard Elder Tess speak about the Ramsey theory um, a few times now. <clears throat> If you're not familiar with it, I'm sure someone on one of the forums will post some useful information. I've spoken about that principle in several studies that I have done in the past. But I never mentioned the theory by uh, a mathematician called Ramsey. Sim to put it simply, human beings look for patterns. We're pattern seekers. I think it was in France, perhaps several years ago, that I got chastised. That means I got into trouble. Because I said, according to Solomon, so I was quoting directly from the Bible, Time and chance happens to all of us.
and Christians, like us priests, just simply don't believe that. They have to find a reason in everything. So I'll leave it to your, to your decision whether or not you think it's a coincidence, chance, or if it's God trying to show us something that these patterns, these numbers, are happening at this camp meeting. We spoke about the year 2005 and the constitutional amendment that was going on in Kansas. And if you've been able to watch Elder Tessie's presentation, she addressed this in number three, I hope. Is it number three, my translator? Yes, I've got confirmation. It's number three. Now, I don't think Elder Tess mentioned Kansas by name. But she mentioned that history. She mentioned 2004, if you remember. And as I said, this happened in 2005. So it was on April the 4th, 1996. That the Kansas State Senate, that means the Kansas government, Congress, they voted on banning same-sex marriage. They won 39 votes to one. And also, uh, part of that vote was that if someone married outside of the state and they, and they moved to Kansas, their marriage would not be recognised. The bill was passed on April the 11th, the same year. So you'll re I hope you remember these dates, they're all tied in with the information that Elder Tess has uh, presented in her studies. So the year 1996 um, is connected with the DOMA Act, I um, hope you all know that. And that will remind us that DOMA means the Defence of Marriage Act. So Kansas is going along with all of this. In 
it's not enough. So in 2005, the Kansas Senate vote in favour of having an amendment to their constitution In February the same year, the House of Representatives of Kansas vote in favour. April 2005, Kansas voters approve the amendment. So I just want to read um, an article that's found in the New York Times. This is April the 6th, 2005. Uh, it's on the Zoom translation forum. It says voters approve amendment banning same-sex marriage. Voters in Kansas overwhelmingly approved a constitutional amendment banning same-sex couples from marrying or entering into civil unions. Seventy percent of those who cast their vote said yes, ban it. So you've held you've heard Elder Test talk about 2004. Then this is 2005. What I want us to be clear is what the 2004-5 history is dealing with. It's a repeat of what's already happened. And I gave you the date for Kansas, which was 1996. The article goes on to say, same-sex marriage is already banned under Kansas law. This is not being challenged. But supporters of the ballot measure said the ban must be in the Kansas Constitution in order to insulate it from legal challenge. So we've discussed this, but now we just read it in a news article. The highest authority in the land is not the president, it's the constitution. You'll notice, if you're reading the article, the governor is a woman. And she opposed this amendment. But 
but listen to what she says, how there's a compromise, even there. She opposes the amendment She's a Democrat. But she supported the existing state law. To me that just seems hypocritical. Now I'm not saying there's anything special about Kansas. Kansas became the 18th state with such a prohibition in its constitution. Next year, 2006, Alabama, South Dakota and Tennessee also want to vote for this similar thing. And 13 other states are proposing um, or discussing that they want to have a, a similar ban. Now, Kansas, like most conservative states, has a history of trying to navigate sodomy. And they got into so many problems because they didn't understand or know how to navigate this problem. First of all, when they were talking about sodomy, they were talking about men with men. And then they didn't know if they can just focus on the mouth, uh, penetration of the mouth, or of the anus. And the whole thing got really crazy. It got to the, to, to the place where sodomy between husband and wife became illegal. even got so bad, I hope you don't be offended by this, but if a man put his wife's breast in his mouth, she, she had penetrated him with her breast And they wanted, and I think they actually made this illegal. They said it's contrary to nature to do such a thing. This is where conservative evangelical thinking takes you. Can you imagine you and your wife do something and you're happily married
then later you have tension in your marriage and you want to divorce And if your wife had put her breast into your mouth, you could get her put into prison for that. So I want to send a picture Uh, so that's been put on the Zoom forum. Maybe someone could post that onto the chat if people want to read that. So this is just a short news article that discusses what we've been speaking about. It's from a local newspaper in Kansas. We won't read it. Okay, I'm just deciding how much information to share or not share. So, I just want to read uh, something which I thought was interesting. No. This is just a new piece of information. So this is a series of newspaper articles from the Topeka Central Journal. It's a newspaper in Topeka, Kansas. I'll send people I'll send the, I'll send you the link for this. It's 12 articles that have been put together. And the, the picture that I sent you was number one of 12. So it begins in 1996. I've already sent you that. Then it jumps to 2005 and there's a picture of the governor. I'm using two computers so someone else has to post it onto the chat. I apologize. I've sent you on the Zoom forum article number three, the third of twelve. And I'm going to read this one. In February 2000, Shortly after his 18th birthday, Matthew had consensual oral sex with a 14-year-old boy. Under Kansas's so-called Romeo and Juliet law, we'll discuss that. Penalties for statutory rape are less severe 
in cases involving two consensual teenagers. So, it's called Romeo and Juliet because they were young teenagers. And there's a law that says if you have two young people and they have sex underage, then the court will take that into consideration because statutory rape has occurred. But if they're both teenagers, the sentence will be much less. It's called Romeo and Juliet because it was designed for boys and girls. We'll continue to read. But the statue... But the statute did not apply to same-sex conduct. If Matthew had engaged in oral sex with a female, a woman, his maximum sentence would have been 15 months. Instead, following his conviction, he was sentenced to 17 years in prison. So, he's 18. If he had had oral sex with a 14-year-old girl, he would have had just over one year sentence. But because he's having oral sex with a 14-year-old boy, this G Romeo Juliet um, clause doesn't apply. What I want, the reason why we're reading this, I want you to think about, I want you to consider how you think. Where your Christian faith takes you. These laws have been created by Christians. Who think it's an abomination for two men to be together. But if a man and a woman commit, we'll call it the same crime, they will reduce their sentence because they see it as common sense. You're not going to put an 18-year-old boy who has consensual um, oral sex with a 14 year old for 17 years put them in prison for 17 years for that everybody would know that's unreasonable and this is the we can call it an anomaly or the stupidity of people people like you and me Christians
because it's a boy with a boy that will just apply the law as it is written thus says Congress and common sense is thrown out and they're going to put him, put him in prison for 17 years and what is his crime? he put his lover's penis in his mouth their lovers remember In Kansas, it's a crime. Now, I'm not arguing about the laws of underage sex. That's not the issue. The issue is, where does your fundamentalism take you? Matthew's attorneys argued the sentence violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Because it punished same-sex acts more severely than opposite-sex acts. After several years of fighting in the lower courts, finally the Kansas Supreme Court made a ruling. And they ruled that the Romeo and Juliet statue was discriminatory. The court removed the words from that law which said, and members of the opposite sex, so they took that out. So, he commits the crime in the year 2000. February. He gets caught, doesn't say how, and he's going to go to prison. This young boy is in prison for five years before they release him. And he's been put into prison for five years because he's a homosexual. This is where conservative Christianity takes you. Can you imagine how that has destroyed his life? He lost five years of his life when he was at his prime, 18, just about ready to go to college or to leave school and do something with his life. I suspect he never even graduated high school. So, um, feel free to read through these 12 articles that take you from the beginning to the end of the saga in Kansas.
Just want to go to um, number eight. If you go to the link, oh no, sorry, I'll 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 give you it. So I'm going to post this on the. Uh, forum so this is number eight we're in the year October 2013 the Supreme Court has already struck down DOMA rejected destroyed it And yet, the Kansas um, Tax Department are still going to tell gay couples they have to do separate filings. They can't do husband and um, couples filings. So you can see how resistant these evangelical Christians are to change. So um, we'll finish there and people can read at their leisure. You'll remember, Elder Tess has mentioned this. When we, when we spoke about the list of important court cases that had utilised or used the 14th Amendment, I left one of those out. And that's the one in 2015. Obergefell, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, versus Hodges. And that was the 2015. That was, uh, you'll all remember it, the 2015 Same Sex Marriage Act under Obama. You remember that. I want to remind you, if you were in the movement in that time period, who got the blame for this? I'm sure I remember everybody blaming Obama. And what's so funny is, this movement didn't understand how the American institutions worked because this had nothing to do with Obama so I hope now we're a lot more savvy we're a lot more clued up with how the American system works And even though Obama was happy, it had nothing to do with him. So, I've said enough about this 2005 history and the 14th Amendment. So we spoke that Christians are happy to give LGBT 
people rights, equal rights. Except on one point, one issue. And what's that? Marriage. They won't allow LGBTQ people to be married. And why is that? Because Christians see that marriage is two people coming together in the sight of, not the state, but in the sight of God. And if the state says, well, they are going to be married and you can't stop it. They will oppose the idea of same sex couples being married in a church. They think. God forbid that they should receive a blessing in the church. Why? It's because Christian marriage is holy. It's an institution ordained by God. And everyone knows what God's opinion on the subject is. Because we're all so wise. We can't redefine marriage based upon our personal feelings or, pace, or based upon a shift in public opinion. So I think same-sex marriage is fine. You're going to say, I don't care what you think. What does the Bible say? What does God think? So my question to you is, what does God think? Not what you think. And the problem with that, we all understand, I hope. Who knows what God thinks? I, for one. I, for one, me, will not accept your dreams and visions on this subject. I don't think I'd accept it on any subject, to be honest. So I'm going to ask for a thus saith the Lord before you tell me you know what God thinks. And when you give me your thus saith the Lord, What will I expect? Correct methodology. And I want to give you one concept, one method, one tool that is very important. I mentioned it some time ago and many people don't agree with this I'm not saying in every verse but I'm saying as a general concept a generalization the Bible is not a book of principles
is not a book of principles. It's a book of examples. I gave one evidence of this. Let's quickly define, I'll give you my definition of what a principle is. It's law that never changes. From dispensation to dispensation, it never changes. And if you take that principle, then ask yourself, is the Sabbath a principle or not? Your answer will have to be, no, it is not. If you take the Bible at face value, a thus saith the Lord. There are three types of being in the universe. Simply. Humans. Angels. And aliens. Beings on other planets. And the last two were created before us. The aliens and angels. They were here long before we were ever created. The Bible says the Sabbath was made for mankind. So was there a Sabbath before humans were created? I have never found any evidence that there is or there was. So if that's the case, Sabbath cannot be a principle. It's something connected with humans. What God decides to do with it in the future, after we leave this planet, that's God's will. So when you start quoting verses to prove your point on marriage and what you believe God thinks, we all need to use correct methodology. So, generally, Christians are going to question whether marriage between two men or two women can ever really be marriage. Now we can't discuss everything regarding marriage in a presentation, even a couple of presentations. But we do know that marriage accomplishes things, it does things. And according to inspiration, one of the things that it does is that it brings us closer to God. So we want to try to answer or discuss some basic questions about the ordinance of marriage. And remember the word ordinance means law or rule of life or regulation. Law, rule or regulation.
Ord the word ordinance. So when we speak of marriage, we want to know what when we speak of marriage, we want to ask what is marriage? What does it accomplish and how does it bring us closer to God? So I'm going to read from Thoughts of the Mount Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. I'll post it on the chat. So it begins page 63. We're not going to read everything from here. So Alan White's going to quote Matthew 19 verse 3. Matthew, Matthew 19 verse 3 and so the context is divorce is it lawful for a man to put away his wife that's the question so Jesus will answer the question And we're going to go down to the second paragraph. And it's um, 63.2 in English. So, I only want to pick up certain portions of this paragraph. I don't want to read it all. So, when you're translating, don't translate everything I'm going to read. I'll tell you when to begin translating. So, you know where to pick it up. When the Pharisees afterward questioned him concerning the lawfulness of divorce. Now, I'm going to translate. Jesus pointed his hearers back to the marriage institution as ordained at creation. He's then going to quote Matthew, uh, sorry, otherwise going to quote Matthew 19 verse 8. He referred them to the blessed days of Eden when God pronounced all things very good. Then the marriage and the Sabbath had their origin. So, Jesus is going to point his hearers, when talking about marriage, back to creation. It's an institution and it's ordained, which means it's an ordinance. To law. Now, I'm just going to add something. There's many bits and pieces to this law. One of them is the following. If you want to have sex with somebody, you need to marry them first. Sex 
outside of marriage breaks this ordinance. It doesn't say it directly, but it's inferred in the passages. In the days of Eden, God said everything was very good. This was the origin or the beginning of two institutions, marriage and Sabbath. And it's going to tell you the purpose of marriage. Reading. Twin institutions for the glory of God, one, in the benefit of humanity, two. So the Sabbath is for the glory of God and benefits humanity and it's the same for marriage. He put their hands together in holy wedlock and said Genesis 2.24 A man shall leave his mother and father, and he shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one. And now, and now we, have, we begin to disagree on how we read. When it says your mother and father... When it says the man and his wife, is that a principle or an example? And conservative Christians, like many of us, read this as a principle. Which means a man cannot leave his parents and marry a man. That's how they will read this verse. As we go through these studies, we're going to see, Lord willing, that that concept, that idea, is warped and distorted. In plain language, it's wrong. Reading on. That which the Eternal Father himself had pronounced good was the law of highest blessing and development for man. So this institution of marriage is a law and it's going to give men the highest blessing and allow them to develop what about the poor women this they're not going to be blessed they're not going to be developed Or does it man mean man? So now you're going to say man means woman.
or man's going to mean human. So we're going to start making our own words up on a thus saith the Lord. Like every other, like every other one of God's good gifts, So now it's not a law, it's a gift. Like every other good gift that God has given to us, entrusted to us, that doesn't sound like a law. Now it's some kind of gift. And he gave this gift to humanity. So now we know that man is human when we compare these two verses. Marriage has been perverted by sin. Now, has that perversion happened because of Adam's sin or your sin? Were the restrictions or the conditions of marriage that God gave after sin good or bad? God gives us all good gifts. Every good gift comes from God. So, the problems with marriage have been created by people like you and me. Mostly you. Not really. But it's the purpose of the gospel to restore its purity and beauty. So the question is, what's it supposed to restore it back to? Is it supposed to restore it back to just after they had committed sin, or just before they had committed sin. Or the day they got married. Now the problem with these questions is, where does this restoration take us to? So that's something that we want to discuss. So we've spoken about why marriage is a blessing. And how it brings us closer to God. Now, Elder Tess, I think in her first presentation, said the following. She stated it as a fact and said that she was not going to tackle this at this camp meeting. And neither am I. And it's this issue. If you are homosexual or lesbian or transgender, is that a choice or is it fixed in your nature? Now, 
as I said, I have not proven that in these studies. But the logic that I would employ is similar to that of which Elder Tess spoke of. Heterosexual people the lust that they feel the passion a man for a woman and a woman for a man do you choose that? I'm not recommending you do this get a pornography magazine with women in it put it in front of a man take their trousers and pants off and see what happens to their genitalia and tell them to resist it and they cannot resist getting an erection not a choice so in the same way if you put a homosexual man in front of that pornography magazine and told the man to do something he wouldn't Give him another magazine full of men and you'll know what happens. So, I want us to be clear. Even if we haven't proven it yet, we believe that your sexual orientation is fixed in your nature, your personal nature. It's not chosen. If that is true, if it's true that you cannot choose your sexual orientation, then we need to modify one <coughs> of two Christian teachings. We have to modify one or the other. So let me repeat. If your sexual orientation is fixed, it's something that you didn't choose. I never chose to be attracted to women. But I am. And I can't help it. And I'm not attracted to men. And I don't even know why. Conservative Christians will say, oh, because God ordained it that way. So if that was the case, how do we explain homosexuals, lesbians, transgender people? The usual answer is, they don't have control, or they're liars. Science has proven all of those arguments wrong. You cannot change someone's sexual orientation without damaging their brain. And that's why so many people from the LGBT community commit suicide.
It's not because there's something wrong with their brains or their mental. They have mental health issues because of the enormous pressure that society places upon them. If I called you a liar from childhood all the way through your life, it would damage you. So, if this is true, that your orientation is fixed and you cannot choose, which it is, then we have to change or modify our understanding of one of two Christian teachings. Number one, Lifelong celibacy. Celibacy means no sex. So you either have to have lifelong abstinence or you have to change the scope of marriage. The arguments are simple. Not, not complicated. We have to decide what we're going to change. Lifelong abstinency or celibacy. Decide how that works. Or change the scope of marriage. How big is marriage? When I mean how big, I mean can it include same-sex marriage? It's as simple as that. Change your views on celibacy or change your views on marriage. Because remember, in the Bible, celibacy is voluntary. So you either change voluntary abstinence or you change who can marry. So remember these two points, it's so simple. Let's close with prayer. Holy God, as we begin to try to grapple with the subject of marriage, And celibacy. Help us to come to the truth. The truth of what your will is for your people. Here at the end of the world. Where you are bringing everything to restoration. It's our prayer, it's our hope, it's our belief that you will restore us so that we will truly reflect your glory. Your honour, your fairness, And your justice. As we consider the subject of same sex marriage, help us to.
come to an understanding of the truth. May we not make a mistake. Because it is one of the twin institutions that you gave to us. To bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name, Amen.